Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. As always, I appreciate you greatly. This week we're discussing the kidnapping of Abby Hernandez. Abby's disappearance took New Hampshire by storm, launching the largest missing persons investigation within the state. I ask you to join me as we discuss the details surrounding her case and how this teenager ultimately saved her own life. Abigail Hernandez was born on October 12, 1998 in Manchester, New Hampshire to her mother Zinya and father Ruben Hernandez. Abby lived with her mother and sister Sarah. Ruben and Zinya divorced prior to Abby's disappearance. Growing up, Abby had what many would describe as a perfect childhood. She was a good student and well known for her athleticism in school. Her peers described her as kind, positive, and overall a joyful person. Abby just started her freshman year at Kennett High School when her life took a drastic change. On October 9, 2013, Abby Hernandez left school on foot, walking the same path she always did back to her mother's house, when she vanished without a trace. At first, no one knew the extent of her disappearance, but by the time 7 p.m. came and went, Zenya was worried. When she came home from work, it appeared Abby never made it home. The dogs had not been taken outside, and nothing inside the house appeared to be out of place. It was unlike Abby to not come home after school, and if she had plans, she would have told her mother. Zenya had a gut feeling that something happened. Zenya headed to the police department and filed a missing persons report. She explained Abby had no problems at home or school. There was no indication that she ran away since Abby took nothing with her. Both her mother and authorities expected the worst, and sadly, they were correct. Abby was abducted. That October afternoon, Abby set off from Kennett High School when she was approached by a man in a navy blue truck. The man offered a ride to Abby, who hesitantly accepted due to her blistered feet from the boots she wore. Abby asked the man to drop her off at a nearby restaurant that was not far from her home. He agreed, but on one condition that he made a quick stop at a Home Depot beforehand. Immediately, Abby felt that she was in danger. When the man stopped the car in the parking lot, she went to remove her seatbelt when the situation turned deadly. Before she could pull the door handle, the man held a gun to her, threatening to shoot her in the head and slit her throat if she didn't cooperate. The man restrained Abby before wrapping a jacket around her head in an attempt to conceal where he was taking her. He also took her phone and destroyed it so it would not be traced. Abby managed to catch a glimpse out of the window, but the man tased her when he realized she could see. This was just the beginning of what Abby described as numerous acts of unspeakable violence. After a drive that seemed to take a lifetime, Abby was taken out of the vehicle and put into a dark room. Her captor taped her eyes shut, then put a motorcycle helmet on her head and zip-tied her to a bed. She was then assaulted for the first time, an act that would be forced on her many times over the course of nine months. Back at home, the investigation was underway. The Conway Police, New Hampshire State Police, and the FBI were all working together to piece together Abby's whereabouts. It was discovered Abby sent several text messages to friends between 2.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. Canines were walked from Kennett High School down the path Abby walked home, where they tracked her scent, confirming she was in the area. Local volunteers contributed by combing thousands of acres near and around the area Abby was taken from. Abby's classmates were affected greatly. They were unwilling to discuss Abby. They just only hoped she would return home safely. One of her peers described the feeling as a thick sadness that was felt throughout the school. They just wanted their classmate to be found. Missing persons posters were on every street post and seen taped in the windows of businesses. The community put forth every effort to help aid the Hernandez family. They begged the community to keep their eyes and ears open. Someone, somewhere, had to have seen something. 
Xenia avoided the press except to deliver pre-written statements at the advice of the investigators. During one of these conferences, Xenia reached to her daughter stating, quote, Abby, you matter to me. I believe you're alive and I know that hope speaks louder than fear. It is my hope that you can reach out to me. I feel your absence every day and I want you home with me, end quote. They all remained hopeful despite the leads running dry and having no answers. A flashlight vigil was held in Schuler Park in downtown Conway. Nearly 500 participants provided the light to help Abby find her way home. Everyone was worried about Abby because no one had any idea what happened to her. Then on November 6, 2013, Xenia received a letter from Abby dated October 22, 2013, two weeks after she disappeared. Initially, the letter was not revealed to the public until the validity of it could be proven. The letter was a start to something bigger, and when it was proven to not only be Abby's handwriting, but also her tone of voice, Xenia was even more hopeful. However, this new lead provided concern for her safety, because it proved Abby wasn't alone, and it was unsure if this letter was forced or written willingly. When word of the letter hit the media circuits, many rumors and speculations regarding Abby's disappearance flooded the town. Many who once searched for the girl started to wonder if she might have left on her own. One of the rumors was that Abby was pregnant and sent away, but Xenia adamantly defended her daughter. She didn't run away, and she was sure she was abducted by someone she did not know. Meanwhile, Abby, who was only 30 miles away in nearby Gorham, was hidden away in a storage container, formulating a plan to save herself. Abby stated, quote, I remember thinking to myself, okay, I gotta work with this guy, end quote. She tried to plead to her captor's inner human by telling him, quote, I don't judge you for this if you let me go. I won't tell anybody about this. I told him, look, you don't seem like a bad person. Like everybody makes mistakes. If you let me go, I won't tell anybody about this, end quote. But Abby's efforts to reason were initially unsuccessful. The man didn't bother to listen to her pleas, but rather lock her away in a storage container where she suffered daily abuse and routine assault. In her moments alone, Abby would pray to God, but she would omit saying amen at the end because she didn't want God to leave her. Over time, Abby eventually gained enough trust from her captor to be allowed into his trailer, where he put her to work printing counterfeit money for him. Her captor couldn't trust her enough to not have a safety net for himself, so he put a shock collar on her to deter any calls for help. Her captor stated it was a little more humane way to ensure she wouldn't try anything funny. He made Abby raise her voice enough for the collar to go off. Once she was shocked, he looked at her and said, okay, now you know what it feels like. The man also demanded that Abby call him master. Over the course of nine months, Abby obeyed her captor, going along with whatever he wanted to do. And over time, a bond was formed between the two. Abby convinced the man she was his friend, and he started providing special treatment to her, such as giving her books so she had something to do. One of these books was a cookbook from inside his trailer. At this point, Abby didn't know what her captor's name was, but inside of the cookbook, a name was written on the cover. She asked the man, who's Nate Kibbe? According to Abby, her captor breathed before responding, how do you know my name? Nathaniel Kibbe was born on July 15, 1980. Kibbe grew up in Conway and attended school at Kennett High School, and from an early age started his criminal career in 1998. At 18, he was arrested for assault, just the first of many charges. One officer who was familiar with Kibbe described him as bright, possessing strong opinions, and thriving on conflict. Kibbe was very involved in his political opinions, conspiracy theories, and was a gun enthusiast. As an adult, he moved to Gorham, but continued to work in Conway as a machinist for EEM Precision, where he was employed for eight years, but let go in April of 2014 due to economic reasons. Some of Kibbe's neighbors stated he was polite and pretty much kept to himself. His landlord said he was often grumpy, but he paid his rent on time and did not have complaints against him. 
There were never any signs indicating he was containing a child in his storage unit. Days before abducting Abby, Kibby was arrested for possession of marijuana, but nothing came from this. Then, in March of 2014, while Abby was still being held against her will, Kibby was charged with assault when he pushed a woman named Tammy Shackford. Kibby rear-ended Tammy and her boyfriend and tried to pay them for the damage. When they refused his offer, Kibby followed the couple to their home in order to assess the damage of their vehicle. When he got out of his car and tried to take pictures, Tammy told him to leave. Kibby became irritated and pushed her. However, the charges against him for this situation were also dropped. Until October of 2013, Kibby had been a petty criminal that no one paid much attention to. So when Abby showed interest in him as a person, he fell for it. In July of 2014, Kibby received a call from a woman named Lauren Monday. Lauren and Kibby met on the internet and he previously gave her $150 in counterfeit money to help her pay for a hotel room. Lauren was unaware the $50 bills were fake and when she tried to use one, she was arrested. She called Kibby and told him that she gave him up. She told him that whatever he was making in his basement, he'd better clean it up right now because they were coming for him. Kibby was sent into a panic mode and decided it was time to get rid of any incriminating evidence in his home, including Abby. After the two scrubbed his trailer free of his criminal dealings, he snuck Abby out in the middle of the night. On July 20th, 2014, Kibby drove now 15-year-old Abby back to North Conway, leaving her steps from where he took her. Kibby made Abby promise not to give him up before driving off. Abby recalled looking up and laughing and just being so happy. Quote, Oh my God, this actually happened. I'm a free person. I never thought it would happen to me, but I'm free. End quote. She walked the one mile back to her home. It was a shocking but exciting reunion for the Hernandez family. Xenia stated Abby was very pale and thin. She'd lost a lot of weight. Abby had a look in her eyes that her mother had never seen before. No information was provided to the public about where Abby had been until they had a complete understanding of the facts surrounding her nine-month disappearance. The only thing released was that Abby had no way of surviving on her own, and she did not know her captor prior. Abby provided a sketch of her captor, describing him as possessing dark skin with dark brown eyes, dark stubble facial hair, slightly overweight, and around five foot four. The information was released to the public in an attempt to identify the suspect. Abby released a statement where she thanked everyone who took the time to search for her and expressed her belief that hope and prayers played a major role in her release. Although Abby knew her captor's name, she was afraid to release the information. Abby decided to withhold his name with everyone but her mother. She confided in Xenia and explained she didn't provide all the necessary information, but she knew his name. On July 27, 2014, Xenia went back to the police and gave them Nathaniel Kibbe's name, which led to his arrest. One week later, Kibbe's trailer was raided and he was taken into custody in Carroll County and held on a million dollar bond. It was revealed during captivity, Kibbe used zip ties, a dog shot collar, a stun gun, and fake surveillance cameras to control her. He made death threats against Abby, her family, and pets in order to frighten her further. In addition to the charges in Carroll County, Kibby was also indicted on 205 additional charges in Coos County, including kidnapping, illegal use of a gun, robbery, assault, criminal threatening, and illegal use of an electronic restraint device. Kibby initially pled not guilty and his trial was set for June of 2016. However, he changed his plea at a preliminary hearing in May 2016. Kibbe was offered a plea deal where he pled guilty to seven charges in exchange for a sentence of 45 to 90 years in state prison and attended a mandatory offender treatment program. Kibbe admitted to his crimes and apologized to Abby. During the hearing, Abby told Kibbe, quote, Some people might call you a monster, but I've always looked at you as human and I want you to know that even though life became a lot harder after that, I still forgive you." End quote. 
In February of 2022, a Lifetime movie titled Girl in the Shed, The Kidnapping of Abby Hernandez, aired starring Lindsay Navarro as Abby and Ben Savage as Nathaniel Kibbe. It's a project Abby served as an executive producer on, an experience she described as healing in some weird way. Abby, who is now 24 years old, leads a private life and is still very close to her family. She has a three-year-old child and works as a hairdresser. She embarks on a new life that she doesn't take for granted, stating, quote, Every time I go outside, now I really try to appreciate sunlight and fresh air. It really went in my lungs differently, end quote. Abby uses her experience to spread a message to others who have survived extreme trauma. She states, quote, Just don't lose hope. Even when you feel like you've lost everything, hope is something that nobody can take away from you. And just keep that, and it'll keep you going. End quote. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Kidnapping cases are always hard to cover, but there is that sense of relief when we get the ending that these children got to go home back to their families. It's kind of an ending that we don't get to see too often in true crime, sadly. But, as always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them in the comment section below and we can chat about this. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more content like this. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you so much for the love and support from each and every one of you. I appreciate this community so much. I hope everyone has an amazing week. You've already made mine. Stay safe out there and I will see you all in the next one. Bye, friends.